Last video was all about how when they say the propaganda line that guns are the leading cause of death for children, they actually mean older teenagers shooting each other. And specifically, in fact, almost exclusively by the data, they mean teens of color shooting each other in urban centers. And then right on cue for anybody who might try to argue that point, in comes the weekend to prove it definitively. Teen shootings of color in where else? Lawless Chicago. Another large teen gathering in downtown Chicago, ending with two teens shot. Hundreds of teens flooded Michigan Avenue last night, smashing car windows, trying to get into Millennium Park. Shots were fired in the crowd around 9 o'clock last night near Michigan and Washington. Two teen boys were wounded, both in fair condition. No one's in custody for that shooting. But of course, these were just shootings of desperation, says incoming Mayor Brandon Johnson, who assuredly will somehow, some way make this war zone even bloodier. Please don't demonize the youth who are starved of opportunity in their own communities, he said in a statement in response to these events. We have to provide spaces for youth to gather safely. So really, this is on all of us as much as it's on them. Not every opportunity has been deprived, though. There's still plenty of opportunity for destroying property desperately. Another male driver was injured when teens started jumping on his windshield, smashing it. And beating randos desperately. Then they beat the man up as he sat in the driver's seat. And don't forget, there's opportunity for gang beating the only white chick in sight so badly I can't even show it on YouTube. Desperately. CNN headline, teens of color bravely defend themselves from racist white woman gentrifying the neighborhood. And of course, there is always opportunity to twerk desperately. Jumping on cars, blocking traffic, and getting into fights Saturday night in the loop near Michigan Avenue. The idea that lack of opportunity excuses or even explains this criminality is, of course, silly nonsense. Because here's the secret about opportunity you are allowed to create your own. You don't have to sit around waiting for someone else to do that for you, let alone demanding that they do. If you lack opportunity, the proper response is to get to work to make some, not destroy the opportunity that someone else created. Which makes the statement from the mayor-elect about not demonizing these people and creating spaces for them exactly backward. We should demonize this sort of behavior because that's precisely what it is, evil in nature. And we should intervene aggressively with it for the same reason, because to tolerate this sort of behavior is to leave the criminals unpunished and enabled to victimize the next guy next weekend. And I know when the mayor says create space, he doesn't necessarily mean no intervention in crime. He means create space for productivity, as in if only there was a YMCA somewhere nearby this scene, then all these criminals would have sat inside filling out job applications all night instead. There is value in choice, sure, but the reality is these criminals are criminals by choice. You could have a six-figure salary for a 10-hour work week available tomorrow, and many of these criminals would still be out shooting each other despite it, and the only gesture to counter that tendency is arrest. Nonetheless, we are seeing this philosophy of criminal lenience in practice all across the country. It's not just some theory to consider in the abstract. This is an idea in active implementation, but it never seems to work out. It's really strange how, despite all the opportunity actually concentrated in these urban centers, more businesses, more charities, more recreation sites, more everything, including government spending, all within immediate proximity, that opportunity, in combination with a relaxed policing attitude to allow the youths to pursue it, Somehow all of that tends not to translate to the reduction in crime that's promised. And there may be no place more relaxed in its criminal prosecutions than Los Angeles County under District Attorney George Gascone, who was elected on a commitment not to prosecute a wide range of misdemeanor crimes. Trespassing, resisting arrest, criminal threats, many others. These are cases that are no longer to be pursued. Instead, Gascon has advocated for the same sort of productive spaces that the incoming Chicago mayor has advocated. Diversion programs for treatment. 
a philosophy emphasizing some sort of recovery rather than punishment. And like many of these related philosophies, they're going to work eventually. They just didn't do it right this time. George Gascon's first two years in office have created an 11% increase in crime in Los Angeles County. Even if Gascon would say he's only relaxing on low-level crime, not serious violent crime, Serious violent crime has also increased during this time as well. Yes, some of this trend is a return to pre-COVID levels, but the rise is beyond just that. Last year's crime numbers in LA are the highest in the last decade. It's not just the quantity of individual crimes, it's the boldness of the criminals to participate en masse. If you're a business owner in LA, it's not just the individual petty shoplifter that you have to watch out for. It's the outright army of them, the mob of hundreds of them emboldened not just to commit the crime in general, but to smile and laugh for the camera while they do. On Saturday night, there was a street takeover in Compton, attracting about 500 people. This is the sort of thing where cars do donuts and drag race and everyone spectates. And then they head on over to the local convenience store to steal every snack and refreshment in sight, as well as whatever else they have. This was an absolute clown car scene, except in this case, the clowns are forcing their way in and grabbing up beer, snacks, cigarettes, whatever catches their heart's desire, and they don't even bother hiding. Clearly visible faces grinning ear to ear, they're even stealing the condoms off the rack, which is very ironic considering their responsible use could have prevented much of this mess. The good news is everything was looted except the Bud Light, so even these looters do have their standards. Or maybe not, it's low resolution footage, but it looks like this guy may have scored a 30 rack. Apparently the shop owner hid locked inside the bathroom while these looters had at it. He was not physically harmed, but the property damage and theft is surely in the thousands of dollars. This sort of event has been happening frequently in the area. There were at least two other street takeovers like this one in Compton on just Saturday night alone. And this particular gas station was just one of six businesses hit with similar treatment, looting, burglary, and vandalism. And yet, despite the scale of these crimes and their ongoing nature throughout the weekend and the criminals not even bothering to conceal their identities, the grand total for arrests made not just over the weekend, but at any time since at all, is zero. Not one. Police are asking for help to identify anybody involved. Well, how could that be? This insanity was going on for hours. Didn't somebody call police to intervene? Oh, they did. It's just police didn't. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department received numerous calls to the area. In fact, deputies showed up, but they were not able to intervene due to safety concerns as the looters greatly outnumbered the deputies. So maybe this was just a manpower reality of dealing with a crowd of that size, or maybe this was the law enforcement philosophy of give the youth their space in action, or Maybe deputies would just prefer not to risk life and limb to arrest people who the district attorney almost certainly won't charge anyway, or maybe it was some combination of all of these factors, but you can see how this logic feeds the problem. It does not solve it. Lenience for so-called low-level crimes and giving space to the youth has grown the mobs committing the crimes. And then the size of the mob is the excuse not to intervene in the crimes as they grow more and more serious. And this cycle continues because it's built on the bunk premise that anybody in these mobs would choose otherwise if they could. No, they chose this regardless. They must be made to stop otherwise. And of course, we can all anticipate what the natural consequences of this behavior will be. The people who invested their lives into these businesses will simply close up shop. And new investment will not take their places because anybody with something to protect can clearly see that it will not be protected here. And then these mobs will really discover what a lack of opportunity is because they looted all the opportunity away. And that is where the last piece of backward logic emerges to try to tie all of this insanity up. When businesses leave these unworkable situations like Walmart is doing in the Chicago area currently, for example, of course, it's not the community's fault for 
looting the business out of business. No, it's Walmart's fault for not operating at a loss at best or at a physical danger at worst. Wonder why? Yes, sir. Our communities look like they look. Well, that we truth. have violence every single day. Speak the truth. It is just not on us. It is on the corporate citizens that come into our community yes. and ravage our community. Yes. Yes. And Walmart. You should be absolutely ashamed of yourself. You are the reason that our communities lack the investment that they have. Again, exactly backward. It's not investment that deters crime. It's crime that deters investment. You want the solution? It's very simple. Stop breaking the law, asshole! It's not the responsibility or obligation of others to make investment on your behalf. It's on you either to build it or to attract it, to make a community worth investing in. Nobody is entitled to somebody else's investment or labor. It has to be earned, and it isn't earned by attacking it on site. And if anybody, from the mom and pop convenience store to the Walmart mega corporation, has capital to invest but chooses not to, you have to ask why especially when they were investing yesterday, but suddenly they aren't today. And if the answer is racism, as is strongly implied in this case and outright stated in many others like it, there are still more questions to ask. If these businesses invested in communities of color yesterday, but not today, did they suddenly become racist overnight? Highly doubtful, but even if so, what changed their mind so suddenly? Was it something they saw? Was it something they experienced that changed their mind about operating in this environment? In other words, if your community creates such hardened racism spontaneously, the next logical question is why? It's the introspection that's the tough part. Pointing fingers outward and blaming everybody else is easy, but rarely does it solve problems. Then again, though, apparently even the $5 price tag for the Cheetos and the Tall Boy is too tough of a problem to solve in this case, so I guess we'll have to be realistic about what obstacles we can clear here, one small step at a time. Unless, of course, it's the step onto the hood of the car to twerk. Only then can we do the big step up. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Minds. That is at M L Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.